Welcome back, everyone. So, communication workshop. Let's get. Let's just jump right into it. Let's just lay down the the big question, which is, uh, how do we make the concept of marine spatial planning interesting? So, we we have four speakers with us this evening who will be sharing their good ideas. And um, before we start, I need to thank um, Alejandro for making this happen. Um, can we put our hands together for Alejandro and his awesome team and everyone that's been putting this together. Thank you very much. And of course, uh, Vinicius for making this all happen. Um, so uh, before we go into the details of the four speakers, I thought to make a quick, quick, quick um, introduction of how we're going to play this out this evening. So we have about 90 minutes between us and your cocktail, your well-deserved cocktail, right? Indeed. Indeed. We all deserve a cocktail. So uh, with, uh, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Chris. Uh, I'm working for Visuality. We're a small consultancy agency based in Brussels. And our superpower is working with complexity, breaking it down into simple messages. That's the basic thing that we do. And we've been invited here today is to shed some light on the simplification of things. And how do we do that is through visual means, through visual methods. So the elements of today is number one, is my colleague Maria. Let's hear from Maria. So what, what, Maria, what Maria is doing today is uh, she is our graphic recorder, or some places they call it a live scriber, or a visual harvester. And her job is to visually capture the talks, the discussions, the ideas, the concepts that we will be sharing, that the speakers will be sharing, you will be sharing today. So this then acts as a tangible artifact of what has been discussed today. So yes, we have uh, live streaming, we have social media, we have video that's being captured, but the thing is that a lot of it gets lost in between, right? So this, with this graph recording, we have an artifact. This is, this is a great tool to, for our follow-up after, after today. So yes, we're only capturing the four speakers today, but usually we, we capture a whole conference. And this uh, works as a fantastic uh, follow-up tool. Uh, so Maria will be visualizing as we're moving along. Second element is in front of you, you should have an A3 piece of paper. Has everyone got one of these? Who hasn't got one of these? We have one, two, three, four, five people here. Thank you so much. And a couple over there. Okay, so once you get your copy, this is what we call is a, a visual template. So this is a fun little way of taking notes of uh, the four speakers that will be sharing their ideas with today. So as you can see, first speaker is uh, Jochen Lamp. And uh, you, so this is really a little page for you to keep your notes. And I would encourage you to doodle or create a visual note with this. So you have a little space to, to draw the face of Jochen. Uh, you have a little space to draw some ideas of what his project is about. You have a little space to draw about some interesting points or possibly quotes that he says under speaker. And third is some of the discussions that we will have together, right? Because we really want to get your feedback. We want to hear your voices. So we want to make use of all the microphones in front. And of course, we will use Slido, and I'll come to that in a second. And then you might see a little star a few stars at the top, and this is really uh, for you just to rate generally with that talk, what was it about, okay? 
And then finally at the bottom, you have some action steps. So at the end of today, what I'd like you to do, and I will be checking in with you guys, is what will you take away when you leave this room? You know, apart from grabbing your cocktail, what will you take away from this session? And what are you actually going to do? Action steps. Wh who are you going to email to possibly create a game or maybe create a cartoon or create a video? So who are you going to reach out to? When, do you, when are you going to do that exactly? And I want you to make a note at the end of that. So we will come to that later on. And, and last but not least, we have the app role. We're going to be using Slido, and we're going to be running two short uh, polls. So uh, Vinicius will, will come to that in a second, and I'll reach out for there, right? So the three, the three, um, the three things we want to capture today uh, is one, is attention. Because we are, we are in the business of trading attention, right? And once, we're, once we hook that attention, it's only then are you, can you inform. Secondly, is conversation. We need to encourage that space, we need to encourage that environment to, to be able to share ideas. Of course, promote uh, collaboration is a given, of course, but that is when we're going to have the true engagement from your public uh, uh, participation. And third is uh, one word I would like to leave with you before we move on to the speakers is empathy which is really about understanding the other person's perspectives. We really need to encourage putting ourselves in the shoes of others to see the world from their eyes. And, that's only that, and it's only then can you start to build trust and at the end mobilize to be able to bring change. And on that note, I'd like to introduce the first speaker. Uh, we have Mr. Johan Lamp uh, from the WWF in Germany uh, with a background as a landscape planner. Uh, Johan works since 1983 for the WWF Germany, first at the Wadden Sea coast since 1991 within the WWF Baltic Sea program. Since 2005, he works on integrated sea use management and promoting sustainable MSP in Germany and the Baltic Sea region. Johan is a co-leader of the European and global WWF MSP working groups, which coordinate the WWF work on MSP. Besides this, he is regularly involved in the NOAA capacity building trainings for MSP. Johan, the floor is yours, thank you. So, good evening, and I have five minutes to go, so, or seven minutes to go, so I try to be quick. What I want to tell you about tonight is that uh, something about communication and uh, more or less uh, something we produced and did in order to start uh, MSP processes and uh, to, to create enabling conditions or help create them. So I will talk about uh, some road shows that we did and about some comics that we produced in, in more detail. So why communication is key? Communication is sort of lacking on all the, on all the levels between, between sectors, between experts and, and laymen, and uh, between, well, many, many uh, parties in that. So that's why we thought, well, we have first, one, when we understood the concept of MSP, to find a way to make this complex and boring issue a bit more, a bit more, a bit more tangible. And another question we heard is, well, 
do the people, do the politicians already have an understanding for the problem that is there that they can create a solution for? So we first pictured the problem of the Baltic Sea. I just flipped through it. That is the, the overlaying sea uses in 2010 still so you see now 2020 if you follow the predictions and 2030 if then we have no prob no problem to solve with MSP then we have done a bad job I think that's what we sold that's why we embarked on MSP, but we also tried to find compatible ways to work together for different countries, so working on transboundary aspects so that these things are compatible, hopefully. First, we tried to learn from abroad. We took three Australians from the Great Barrier Reef to the Baltic Sea uh, on a kind of roadshow to Stockholm, to Helsinki, to Tallinn, to Berlin. We invited our government people, our experts, and confronted them with John Day, at that time the manager, uh, Virginia Chadwick, the head of the, of the department, and the minister in charge who had to lose or to win something from integrated sea use management. So, and uh, that was quite of an eye-opener to promote integrated sea use management, integrated and sustainable biodiversity-oriented planning. We are WWF, that's why we went into that. That was quite a successful thing, I opened eyes. We repeated this within the uh, EU project Baltic Sea Plan a couple of years later in 2011 when we took experts from uh, Europe, from Sweden, from Germany and uh, ourselves to uh, Riga, Tallinn and Helsinki where there was no sp uh, spatial planning at, at that time to also have a kind of a roadshow to promote this idea and we had about about 190 to 100 persons in the meetings in these partly small countries. So I skip that and then Another thing is, well, talking about, about uh, communication, we produced a cartoon to make it simple, to make people smile and to understand the complexity of it, but also the, that it is a process that is feasible. So the need for coordination of sea uses, find simple analogies, add some humor, make people smile, and also it should, be short, it should be short, so we named it Become a Maritime Spatial Planner within 10 minutes, which is not that long. So the concept was uh, to introduce the current situation, complicated political framework, analogies to tribal societies, so it's not new, it's just new names, having serious stuff of uh, definitions and mapping, and what was the key? We won a brilliant cartoonist, Eric Lieberman, who worked for us and pictured out these different characters in that cartoon. So that was quite a successful thing. We produced it in English first and step by step in seven languages. Uh, the Russian version is just under preparation now. Uh, it is used, uh, well, worldwide, you can see it. Uh, we also have it on YouTube as an animated version and uh, also if you want to do this likewise we also can offer this as a sort of download tool to fill in your own translation. So we have even a Vietnamese uh, version. So the target group is quite diverse, sector experts, politicians, journalists, we use for politicians we use it when the European Directive was voted, we sent to each member of the European Parliament one copy, where we had in his own language, stakeholders, students, the same. My colleagues said, oh, you did that cartoon, can't you do one on EBM? It took me three years to get there, what it means to translate ecosystem-based management into practical things. We used that as well, had the same 
the same target. The first one I gave to Angela Merkel when, <laughs> when I was, had the opportunity to give it to her. So at least it is also for politicians. And uh, based, of course, on some real, uh, real stuff on the Malawi principles where we started from, and we go by and, and, and also tell what does it mean for each sector. So this was uh, presented, I think, last, early last year. We have now three um, translations ongoing, uh, ready, and the Russian is underway. So also we can have offer a template for translation. So now I have three seconds left. Thank you. Stay right there. Thank you so much, Johan. Um, storytelling, the power of storytelling. How, in your experience, have you ha have you been able to tap into the power of storytelling, sto the power of storytelling to pass the message through this format of cartooning? Well, it, the, the the cartooning is one thing. The the roadshow is another. For example, when when we had the Australians there, and they said, well. You start with seeing your problem before you offer a solution. So that is that that, that was something. Or that, that the Australians said, "Well, the, we had the minister here in in, in our ses sessions, and I think what was was important was that he said, well, I was convinced by my by my staff for this for this concept of integrated CEOs management, but please tell me." Will I lose my elections, which are in front of me, or will I win them? So he took the risk, and he won his elections. So that was a story which was good to tell to very shy politicians when it comes to taking risks on a new method to, to apply. This is just one thing or another thing when we worked with, a, with the MSP that we said, well, the fishermen always say, well, it's, we are hunters and we are not farmers, and so on. And uh, each area is as important as any other for us, so we need all. Then one of our spatial planning ladies said, okay, if that is the case, then we can choose what we want. You will always lose one important area or one unimportant, it's equal. So it's up to us to choose and not to you because you don't want to, to lose an area. So it's all the same, the values are the same. Uh, that made at least the fishermen think it over that they might identify their crucial areas and not saying, well, we want it all and there is no compromise. Great, thank you. And another question I had was um, your next project. Hmm. How, is there anything that you have learned from that cartoon project that you can take on to the next one and how, something that you can do better or improve on well, or develop on? Well. It, 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 it's not my, my next project, but what I can think of what would need some, some help might be also the SDGs. So how to, how to bring this into a simple thing. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Any questions from the audience? Going once, twice. There's one. Yes. Please. Just push the little microphone button right there. Oh, thank you. Sorry, Just say was, your name and organization, your question. That was thank way you. too formal for me. You have to press the button. In. Uh, oh, I'm Paul Gilliland. Some of you probably worked out who I am from the earlier session. Um, so the cartoons are, are great. We've actually sometimes used them ourselves in, in communications. Um, but I, it's almost want to flip around the premise of the question that's <clears throat> been asked of all of us, which is what um, communication style works best for you? <clears throat> which is, ha has the use of those cartoons actually turned off anybody? Has anyone go, do you know what, that, that really doesn't do it for me, that looks a bit childish, I actually feel less engaged, or has it been all positive? We... <laughs> In the beginning, we, we sent some draft around, and then we had some concerns from some of our agencies, and you cannot blame the Danish for doing this and that. Uh, that was in, in that phase when there were some anxious 
people in, in some of the administrations who said, oh, how can you do it? But once it came out, and for example, I showed this to the Russian delegate in the, the, the draft, and uh, the lady asked them, oh, oh, Vladimir, that's you, with a smile. And then I thought, okay, we made it. <laughs> so, not really. Answer. Excellent. Thank you very much for that question. We'll go for another round of questions once we've had all the speakers speak. Um, one thing I'd like to add to, to that question really is to promote um, co-creation. So if you are probably stuck on trying to find a style that works, I would encourage people to really reach out to the audience, to your end audience, and develop it with them. So I think co-creation is one of the key things that we could take up. So, so Johan, of course we, thank you we, very much. We can offer this, these templates also to use if somebody wants to. Absolutely, excellent. Thank you very much. Let's hear for Johan. And let me remind you that uh, if you have taken notes, please tweet about it. Don't forget to use the hashtag. MSB 2017 Paris. Uh, and our next speaker. Our next speaker, Marianne Stuver. Uh, senior, research, uh, senior researcher uh, from the Wagga Wagga University, uh, which is east of the Netherlands. Uh, she's actually a doctor in social sciences. Uh, Marianne is a senior researcher with broad experience in the social sciences. Her areas of expertise include Maria, uh, marine spatial planning, multi-stakeholder processes, blue growth. She has a track record in EU projects and in international organizations such as the United Nations, as well as local governmental projects. Marie has a proven ability to manage complex, multiple stakeholder projects from definition through completion. Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Chris, and thanks Alessandro for inviting me, and Paris and UNESCO as well. Um, the, Jochen, the thing that I re uh, uh, remember most from your presentation is to smile, and actually I'm very smiley today because we got a really good uh, election result in the Netherlands. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to show you a video of three minutes, actually with, of one minute is only subtitles. So I want to ask the technicians to cut the subtitles once we're at the end of the video. And um, I would like you to remember three things from my presentation. One is multi-use platforms at C. The second one is co-design. And the third one is impact. So I'm going to ask some of you, who is, knows what MUPs are, multi-use platforms at C? Nobody. Who has seen the video of Mermaid before? One, two people. Wonderful. So, um, actually, I'm going to show you a video which is called uh, From Mermaid on Multi-Use Platforms at Sea. And multi-use platforms at Sea are the same as a mermaid. They're non-existing fictional constructions. Um, which we worked on with 25 partners throughout Europe for the last four years. And um, I think we should start the video and then you'll get a notion first of what multi-use platforms at sea are. Within the next 10 years, the ocean and seas will be subjected to a massive development of marine infrastructures. I believe that uh, support for multi-use platforms uh, in the ocean is going to be something that will be increasingly important as we go forward. Increasingly important as space in the ocean uh, at the coast is going to become more precious, um, so we need to move into deeper waters. In doing that, I think it is important that that is done sustainably. If we're going to do that sustainably, then we have to look at multi-use of these platforms particularly from the point of view they cost an awful lot of money. Uh, so to get a return on the kind of investment that's involved, I think you can't just say that a platform is for one use only. These offshore developments need to use the available ocean space in a more optimal way in order to reduce the high investment costs without exerting pressure on the marine environment. These offshore developments will have to be optimized in order to reduce the costs, to use the ocean space efficiently 
but also to minimize the negative environmental impact. Therefore, the Mermaid Project will develop concepts for the next generation of offshore platforms, which can be used for multiple purposes. The project will examine new concepts which combine infrastructures for energy extraction, aquaculture and platform-related transport. Scientists are studying four test sites in Europe with different environmental characteristics. The Baltic Sea, the Wadden Sea, the Atlantic Ocean, the Mediterranean Sea. This research is of interest to stakeholders and end users. It will contribute to the sustainable use of the European marine resources upon which many economic and social activities depend. Okay, I'm gonna ask someone what does come to your mind first when you see this video? Multiple use. Thank you. And you? See? Okay, multiple use. Someone else. Something else. Oh. Synergy. Synergy. Something else? Creative? Creative remark? Blue growth. Blue growth, okay, that's a good one because tomorrow morning we're going to talk about blue growth, so I'm not going into that today. Governance. Sorry? Governance. Governance, very good. I'm not going into blue growth today. Tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock you can uh, come to our presentation on that. It's going to be about communication now. What is very visible from this video is that's a very science-based communication, a very technical communication. While the Mermaid project actually was on co-design. So what we did is that we had in the four different regions, we had round tables and we invited different stakeholders to co-design with us. So a very good thing about this video is that it actually makes the multi-use platforms at sea visible because and they don't exist. So what happened after this is that there have been much more initiatives going on to make them come true. So maybe in 20 years they do exist. Um, but they can only exist if, they have, if, if this type of projects have impact. And impact is not only through communication on videos, it's also on making the techniques and the co-design and the real concepts of design and technical options come true. That's what I wanted to say. It's six minutes. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Could you please share with us the experience you had or your team had on the co-design phase? I, th I think that's really, really important to, to, if we can shed some light on that. Can I stay here? Yeah. Yeah, so um, the, the, the first consortium meeting we had with Mermaid was with 80 people, and of which were 30 people from industries and 50 scientists. And we decided that if we want to make designs for the four different regions, we needed really to have a discussion with each other on the preconditions of design, on the effects of design for the regions and on the objections of different communities in which uh, the designs would uh, take place. So we traveled a lot to uh, Grieger's Vlak in Denmark, uh, the Atlantic Ocean, the North Sea, and we involved as many stakeholders as possible to talk with us on multi-use platforms at sea. But actually, when we did an interview in the beginning, we asked them, but they didn't know what it was. So it was a very interesting kind of interaction. And um, all along, uh, it became clear that uh, getting the sake, so the, the, the fishermen, the, 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 wind, the, the energy industries, the local communities, NGOs, politician, uh, po policy makers, of which one is Lodewijk, the next speaker, um, all had their own ideas on how to uh, evolve these technologies and how to fit them into the marine spatial plans that were also co-evolving along the way. So 
What was it? 80 people, right? You said 80 people. Yeah, 25 partners. 25. Nine, and, 9 million euros. And I, and I would imagine getting those people in a room can be quite challenging, right? I mean, how do you work on those challenges? Because everyone's got a say, everyone's got an idea, everyone says yes, some people say no. I mean, how do you deal with those, those situations? Yeah, now you get into the communication within a project because we had like eight work packages and in all work packages there were 10 people and there were 25 institutions from all over Europe. And we invited external stakeholders at the round table. So it was a lot of coordination and um, you said we need simple messages, but um, at the same time, we are living in a complex world in which all these things go evolve at the same time. So. Uh, it took us already a year for people to grasp the idea of what a multi-use platform would be and mean for them and their own economy and their own well-being. So, um, yeah, it took a lot of work and a lot of communication. No, I can imagine there must be a lot of work just to simplify, just to bring it down to its core idea. I mean, it's, uh, I think simplification is... It sounds easy to, uh, to do, but it's very, very difficult. So, yeah. Uh, thank you for that. Let's, uh, let's take a question from the audience. Right here in the front, thank you. Uh, I wonder, I mean, you're talking on the second step, 80 people participating, institutions, who had the idea? And what was the motivation to do something like that? And I can, I can figure out that perhaps wind farms struggling not to be alone uh, against challenging of people, because it's likely affects, you could say, well, we can do further. I can imagine a brilliant scientist saying, we can use platform. Who, where the idea came from? How, it's the first time I've seen it, and uh, it's a new, uh, innovative and new idea for me, but I would like to, it doesn't came from 80 people one day sitting on, in a table or in a workshop, it came from from, from where? Who promote? Who was the first promoted? The core group, the five ones, the one. Can you expand on that? Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, audience, but um, at least I know it is, was very policy pushed by the European uh, U uh, Union and DG Mare to have uh, uh, this type of uh, projects, scientific projects, in, in the FP7, the last round of the, F uh, so the FP7 uh, round. Uh, however, um, for instance, in Krieger's Flak, there were already energy companies like Dong uh, working with uh, uh, fish cages, uh, fish farmers, uh, to see it, uh, if it was possible to get fish farms in the in the realm of the uh, of the wind turbines. So it started actually, I think, by, by by companies that thought maybe we can combine resources or transport and make the synergy better. And um, I don't know who, it's actually a good question, but someone picked it up and it was in, in, uh, in the call and it, it's only getting bigger because we now have uh, already several projects going on that focus especially on the, the combined use in platforms but also in areas. Because of course parts of the sea have always been used by different people at the same time, so it already existed, only now we embrace it in terms of sustainability and synergy. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your question. We'll go, we'll go for another round of questions later on. Um, so who, who here who so far has managed to use that little visual template? Raise your hand. And who's going to dare to send out a tweet right now? Yes, you are. Thank you. Next up, we have... Uh, Ludwig Apspol from the Ministry of Infrastructures and the Environment, Netherlands. Ludwig is a senior policy advisor for the EU integrated marine time policy, including marine time spatial planning at the coordinating ministry for the North Sea. He considers that bringing together the oceans and the coastal community, the scientific world, concerned civil servants and politicians within the digital aquarium should help us in sustainably managing and developing our common heritage that the ocean is. Ecologically sound is also business sound. The marine world, 
to my belief, shows us the way to a sustainable future. All we need to do is listen, look, and learn. Ludwig, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chris. Could you, this, you can hear me, can you hear me? Oh, great, great. Um, that's important. <laughs> if nobody can hear me, then the communication fails automatically. Um, who knows the simplest communication uh, method uh, there is? Like, there are three things needed for communication. Actually, three things. There is somebody who is sending a message, and then you have a blur, and then you have the receiver of the message. And if the message does not come across, the only one who can change it is the one who is sending out the message. That's the only one who can somewhat uh, do something with the blur uh, in between. Um, this is also to illustrate that what I'm doing, what my team with me uh, are doing, is not completely uh, just playing without scientific base. Um, I was asked to introduce the Maritime Spatial Planning or Marine Spatial Planning board game uh, to you today and talk about the rationale, the creation, and the results so far. Um, I'm not going to name all these people, but uh, I saw a question coming up uh, whether maritime spatial planning could be easily transferred to other parts of the world having a, a different type of thinking than the Western world. The answer is yes, and the method is gaming. This game will most likely be redeveloped by the Chinese University of Dalian over the coming month. Now I'm going to ask you to do something you maybe not have done before. Um, looking at the presentation and a video with your eyes closed. Not all the time, it's a one and a half minute movie, but it's with really nice music. I'm not going to sing, somebody else will do. Um, but it's really fun to close your eyes for a couple of seconds, then open it again and then see how the gameplay developed. It's about tying knots. Oh, can we start the video, please? It doesn't work with my remote. Hold your breath, hold on tight, hold on to the days of innocence. A tidal wave on its way, but I won't close my eyes in ignorance. All those colors inside of you, drowning in a world. sun come out don't lose sight in dark of night cause you're the light to break the cloud So sorry, we had a nicely faded out. Sander, I'm really sorry that I messed up your movie. Uh, he did so much hard work to get it done with the uh, nice ending of the movie. Thanks to WWF Netherlands, in this case, for providing us the license to operate with their music. Um, maritime spatial planning or marine spatial planning is a process. We all know that. It should be politically guided and stakeholder driven. Um, luckily, I do quite a bit of work in the Netherlands, and I developed a 2050 vision for the Netherlands, so uh, I had a ghostwriter on that, and that was my minister, Melanie Schultz van Hagen. So I built a bit of trust, and then I was allowed to do what I love most. Work on serious gaming. Who did play a game last week? One. 
three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, okay, good, good. Uh, it keeps you young, playing. Uh, I play, love to play with my niece. Uh, love with friends, with such a thing. Uh, we need to develop a common language. That's the most important thing. That's a challenge, it's a real challenge. One challenge there is, develop a common understanding. Jochen uh, explained it to us as well. But the other thing is to create a level playing field. So we've looked at areas around the world, and this, see, you will not find anywhere else. This is a level playing field for people trying to talk about short sea shipping and maritime spatial planning. The inspiration came from the picture on the left, the digital aquarium. We can walk and see and feel and be in touch with the human, uh, humans as well as the ecological environment. Then the language problems occur and we need to know what was where. But you need to train the trainers too. We are a small community still. Last time I had a talk in the Azores, I said, how many spatial planners do you need? I changed my mind. We need a lot. And we need a lot of people to understand what it's all about. Because we have a lot of discussions amongst ourselves before reaching out to the stakeholders. But yeah, well, then you have to make the game, take a map, Old school, we had one hour to do the game with uh, some stakeholders. And this is the making of. Half a, mo a month and a half, five people, and then go on and on and on and on and on. We did a second round because people like to play the game and the Scottish government has a game right now. And then it's not about maritime spatial planning anymore, it's about blue development. This is what we want. We want ecological and economical development. And we want to be in touch with people from um, amongst other seas at risk. We want to have fun. And this is the most challenging one, tying the knot. I've met in so far um, maybe 10 people who can easily tie a little knot, a sailor's knot. And we are talking about maritime spatial planning. Where are we right now? After a year and a half. Uh, we got on the news, we had uh, an invitation from the Belgium government to come and play with 120 of their stakeholders, that was really cool. Uh, we have two PhD students who just finished their first paper, which is on the review. Um, we were in eight countries so far, and uh, we have a board game which you can ship and you can play tomorrow as well. And these are my answers to your questions, uh, Chris. I prepared them already. You want to ask them, or shall I just ask the questions for you? Yeah? Okay. No, back, so I got this up. How to explain MSP to stakeholders. Um, easy way. Easy way. We, just, we are in it together, if you like it or not. If we have a political assignment to do something with the sea and the uh, adjacent coasts, it's all about humans who live on land. And if that political decision is being taken, we just should take a walk at the beach, get to know one another, see what are the interests, see who knows what and who can contribute. And uh, don't forget that Galene, one of the 50 daughters of Neptune, is there to guide us uh, in this. And another question, how to get politicians on board? They are on board. Gesine Meissner is the member of European Parliament of the seas, rivers, islands and coastal areas. Hence, we were allowed to call our game the Rika Sea. It's an anagram, we changed it. She loves to play, she adores it. How to get it? In the middle is the minister of uh, the North Sea of Belgium. You have to give them something to bite in. They love to play politicians. They love to be in touch with stakeholders. They are themselves all the time. So treat them as you would treat your stakeholder. On the left, Carmo Nuvella, he nicked one of our tokens, and since then we normally distribute it if we have a session, so people can also have a little uh, memory. And uh, these are the regional ministers. They also love to have, make fun and have a party. Third question I got, how to communicate it. It's easy, it's really easy. Keep it simple, keep it stupid simple. Rule of kiss. We don't do it for us. We do it for next generation. And we want the ocean system and its seas and coasts to provide for long term, provide for our children, provide for our grandchildren. So yes, there are issues to overcome when managing ocean and sea space. 
But if you ask them the question, for who do you do it? And do you want to go with me on this journey to figure out the best way for the future? They will all say yes. And from then on, it's just the little smile and empathy. Thank you very much. Ludwig, thank you for that. Um, gaming. I love games. Last week I was playing the game, uh, the board game Catan. It's this awesome strategic game. Um, so what is, what is the magic behind gaming? Why, how, why is it that is it so exciting and so engaging and so motivating? And how, what's, what's the science behind it? Tell us. Um, it's a little bit in, in this game as, particularly. Um, the the uh, fact that people start talking, doing something together, getting to know one another uh, in, in a very different way than they did before, uh, helping one another out. We made the board especially this large, so you cannot solve your problem by yourself. If you want to connect one port to another port, it's so far off, you almost need to be in touch with somebody else to get it fixed. And uh, so we, we build in a little, a little of those tricks, and uh, sometimes we provide drinks with it. But uh, what is difficult for some people, they don't want to play, because they don't want to know how to win. But the winner in this game is the one who learned the most about the other, who can take that lesson and then do something with it in the future. We learn so, lo so much just by moderating it, and that's, uh, that's a really rewarding thing. I hope that answers your question. And otherwise, I wouldn't know. I know that if you stop playing, that you really get old. That that's yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, we we we, we spoke earlier, and uh, you you had mentioned that uh, this be, this game has been going on for like a year and a half, and you have learned so much. So my question is then, what <laughs> can you pull out of these learnings that that could possibly uh, maybe give birth to another game, or possibly give birth to other strategy, uh, strategies to play the game? Is there something that you can pull out from the learning so far? Um, yes, for instance, uh, what I learned is that my colleagues around the North Sea uh, do not know their, uh, the, 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 uh, what stakeholders want, for instance. I was very surprised to learn that a few of them don't know that Oceana and Seas uh, uh, at Risk and, and Greenpeace are advocating for a 30% no take, no come, no nothing zone at sea. Uh, so immediately you put that to effect and say, hey, come on, we need to focus on what stakeholders are really doing. Um, the Scottish version at this moment is being used in real stakeholder processes. Um, and we have another game which is more digital. Uh, aquarium, which is SimCity, in which we try to bring together the uh, eco uh, ecosystem modeling and the human modeling, so as to, to bring together a real decision support system. But for the moment, we cannot do that. Uh, we have to test it, try it, uh, and make it fun, and disclose information. Um, but I, I had once had the question, can we make a game of this? And if you have that question ever, the answer is always yes. You can gamify everything. Just needs a bit of work sometimes, a couple of years, Jochen, uh, but it's doable. No, thank you very much. I encourage everyone uh, today over the, during the cocktail or tomorrow, if you're going to stick around, I encourage you to check out the game, give it a go. Thank yeah, you very yeah. much for that. Because you're in this experiment. You can be part of this experiment. Uh, how, to do, how does a C develop if all the participants of this conference make one or two moves? And then it's being recorded and we're going to use it in a scientific paper. So, come and join the game. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for a, a, a question, but we'll say if you can save that question for after the, the next speaker. Ludwig, thank you very much. So, our next speaker is Terry Oyon, uh, who's a contract manager at uh, Ceramen, uh, engineer, legal expert, and graduated from the HEC Paris. Terry started his professional career in the sanitation sector, working on big-scale water-based sanitation systems at Ceram, uh, one of Suez's uh, subsidiaries located in Marseille. Terry has also worked in collaboration with the Metropole au Marseille, with whom he published the scientific paper L'Affaire, 
a global control center for territories issues. Uh, Terry, the floor is yours. Uh, allow me to inform you all that uh, Terry will be speaking in the wonderful language of French. So if, like uh, myself, your French is not as great, uh, please uh, refer to your headphones. Thank you very much. Terry, the floor is yours. Ça vous aura peut-être laissé le temps de régler, du coup, les traductions. Voilà, bien, bonjour. Moi, je vais vous parler de, de protection des océans, effectivement, comme, euh, comme euh, nos pré enfin, les prédécesseurs l'ont fait, et notamment Lodvik. Et effectivement, je vais vous parler de, du littoral. Du littoral qui est au cœur aujourd'hui des métiers de Suez, c'est une problématique centrale. Et moi, je vais essayer de vous en parler au travers d'un exemple, qui est un exemple marseillais, à Marseille, nous avons un littoral et 21 plages. Et la problématique que nous avons eue, c'est une problématique de pollution, notamment de pollution des eaux de baignade. Et je vais essayer de partager avec vous la manière, le mode qu'on a utilisé, tout simplement pour embarquer avec nous dans nos solutions techniques, à la fois les élus locaux, mais également, finalement, les usagers et les citoyens. Alors, de, de manière générale, vous le savez, vous le savez encore mieux aujourd'hui et après ce qu'on vient de dire, euh, les océans subissent les contraintes des métropoles. Aujourd'hui, 50% de la population mondiale vit dans des villes. Et à horizon 2050, ce seront 66% de la population qui vivront dans des villes. Ces métropoles produisent par exemple 300 millions de tonnes de matières plastiques chaque année et 10% de ces matières plastiques finissent dans des océans ou sur le littoral. Face à cette situation et face au constat également que de manière intrinsèque, finalement, les métropoles provoquent également de la pollution et notamment la pollution des eaux de baignade. Les métiers de Suez qui adressent classiquement, vous le savez, le grand cycle de l'eau et puis les problématiques plus domestiques du petit cycle de l'eau ont fait un objectif commun finalement, ont déposé un objectif commun comme une priorité, la protection de la ressource. Et face à cette situation, je voudrais simplement vous citer quelques exemples. Vous voyez à l'écran l'usine de Perth en Australie. Cette usine, parfaitement respectueuse de son environnement, tout simplement parce qu'on a pu mettre au point un système de réinjection de la saumure qui respectait finalement l'environnement après le dessalement. Vous avez également des images sur le laboratoire Plastlab pour la valorisation pardon, des matières plastiques et également une image du projet microplastique dont vous savez aujourd'hui les effets sur la biodiversité et notamment sur la faune. Alors, j'ai gardé pour la fin l'exemple de Marseille avec l'utilisation de deux modèles pour connaître et pour partager des notions de qualité des eaux de baignade. Alors, pour que vous compreniez mieux quelle était la problématique, euh, je voudrais simplement rappeler le contexte marseillais. Marseille, c'est une cuvette de 150 km imperméabilisée, tournée vers la mer, et Marseille subit des pluies torrentielles d'août à décembre. Donc, de manière régulière, ces pluies sont évacuées par le système d'assainissement, comme on le verrait dans n'importe quelle ville. De manière classique également, ce système d'assainissement à Marseille dispose d'une partie qui est plus vétuste que les autres, cette partie qui fait 400 km, confère finalement au territoire, lorsqu'il pleut, trois sensibilités. Une sensibilité aux débordements qui peuvent se produire dans l'agglomération, une sensibilité également finalement au déversement et donc à l'atteinte du milieu naturel. Et vous voyez dans la zone blanche, c'est la zone des plages finalement, l'endroit où on peut avoir des déversements lorsqu'il pleut. Et enfin, la troisième problématique, c'est une problématique d'échouage de déchets qui sont charriés quasiment à chaque pluie importante par les 55 km de rivières urbaines. Peut-être ignoriez-vous qu'à Marseille, il y avait des rivières urbaines. Ben, c'est le cas. Et elles charrient des déchets que vous pouvez retrouver quasiment à chaque pluie importante sur les plages. Alors, je vous propose, face à cette triple sensibilité, de voir un petit film qui vous expliquera comment, finalement, la situation a été prise en compte et quelles solutions techniques nous avons mis en œuvre.
Marseille est une vaste cuvette imperméabilisée tournée vers la mer, bénéficiant d'un climat méditerranéen très ensoleillé, mais aussi générateur d'épisodes orageux torrentiels, source potentielle de pollution et de débordement. Ces rames déploient une hydromère temps réel qui s'appuie sur le couplage d'un modèle marin et d'un modèle hydraulique permettant de connaître à chaque instant la dispersion en mer d'une pollution sur l'ensemble du littoral marseillais. Nous voulons créer la notion de smart plage, plage intelligente, plage interactive, plage transparente pour la ville de Marseille. L'innovation consiste à faire tourner deux modèles de simulation numérique. L'un qui simule le fonctionnement du réseau d'assainissement et des cours d'eau et l'autre qui simule le fonctionnement du milieu naturel. Alors cette application numérique nous permet de passer d'un principe de surveillance réaction à celui de prévision anticipation. Voilà, alors vous, vous avez compris, ou vous avez commencé à comprendre à travers ce petit film, que la solution mise en œuvre à Marseille, c'est finalement, euh, et, et sans être effrayé par l'écran, une véritable chaîne d'information environnementale. Et l'idée, et ce qui est important aujourd'hui dans cet atelier, c'est de dire que cette chaîne d'information, elle est partagée à la fois avec les usagers, avec les citoyens, mais aussi avec les collectivités locales. Alors pour mieux comprendre quelles sont les informations qui sont partagées, je voudrais simplement qu'on déroule une journée classique d'été à Marseille. Cette journée, elle commencera par les prélèvements sur 21 plages et des analyses quasiment sur toutes les plages de Marseille tous les jours. Et en parallèle, l'utilisation de modèles qui vont permettre finalement de prévoir les débordements, les déversements et également les dispersions en mer de la pollution. Et c'est là que le, le, la solution numérique est partagée puisque ces informations-là sont transmises à aux collectivités locales et aux élus pour prendre des décisions d'ouverture ou de fermeture de plage. Et à l'issue de ces décisions, ces informations sont envoyées sur l'application Marseille Info Plage, qui cette fois-ci est à destination des, des usagers et des citoyens. Alors, j'ai parlé des modèles sans euh, vraiment rentrer dans les détails. Je voudrais simplement que vous re reteniez, parce que je vois le temps qui, qui s'égrène rapidement, je voudrais que vous reteniez finalement les images qui sont vues chaque matin, donc si vous pouvez lancer le film, s'il vous plaît, en régie, merci. Euh, effectivement, vous voyez à l'écran ce que, à la fois, les opérateurs d'assainissement, mais également, finalement, les citoyens et aussi les élus peuvent euh, avoir comme image. Alors, je, je crois qu'il y a une difficulté pour lancer le film, mais peu importe, vous l'aviez vu précédemment. L'idée, c'est quoi c'est d'obtenir une vision de la pollution tout au long de la journée sur chacune des plages. Et encore une fois, l'idée, c'est de partager cette information, car on connaît la durée de pollution d'une plage, et c'est cette information qui va être importante et partagée effectivement avec les usagers. Alors, je pourrais vous dire que les informations du modèle sont également recalées, parce que le numérique, c'est bien, mais la réalité, finalement, d'une sonde, c'est également important, et les deux permettent de caler finalement l'information qui est fournie. Et enfin, quasiment pour terminer, l'idée, c'est de vous dire qu'aujourd'hui, l'application que vous aurez entre les mains si vous la téléchargez, elle vous permettra, si vous êtes un touriste ou si vous êtes un usager marseillais des plages, elle, elle vous permettra de savoir si la plage où vous avez décidé d'aller va être ouverte ou si elle va être fermée, la couleur de son drapeau, la température de l'eau, elle vous permettra de connaître également finalement l'évolution de la qualité de l'eau tout au long de la journée, savoir si vous allez rester à la plage longtemps, pas longtemps, si vous allez y aller finalement à 14 heures, en famille ou pas. Et enfin, cette application, elle permet également de faire finalement de son usager, de son utilisateur, un véritable éco-citoyen, tout simplement parce qu'il a la possibilité de signaler une anomalie relative, par exemple, à l'environnement ou aux déchets, par le bouton prévu à cet effet. Alors, je terminerai sur une image qui est finalement l'enrichissement de cette application. Nous avons décidé de partager avec les citoyens, via cette application, les résultats d'un certain nombre de projets que vous connaissez sans doute ou dont vous avez entendu parler, la remise en place d'algues, la réimplantation d'algues dans la rade de Marseille, la création d'abris dans les ports pour protéger les juvéniles qui sont souvent prédatés et également, finalement, une évaluation de ce qui est la pression des métropoles que j'évoquais tout à l'heure sur les océans. Et enfin, je vous invite à cet égard à aller observer la maquette, vous l'avez peut-être déjà fait sur le showroom de Suez, cette maquette qui vous présente les solutions pour une ville littorale. 
Je vous remercie. Thank you, Terry. Could you shed some light, a little bit more light, on the, um, the process of developing that interactive app? I think I'm very curious to hear a little bit more about that. Oui, effectivement. Alors. Ce qui est intéressant, et c'est sans doute assez innovant pour, cette, pour ce type d'application, euh, et, et je suis venu vous en parler aujourd'hui parce qu'initialement, je m'occupais justement de la préservation de la qualité des eaux de baignade à Marseille. Et c'est justement parce que je m'en occupais que j'ai souhaité poser les diverses fonctionnalités et au fond traduire le métier qui était le mien, qui est finalement un métier d'exploitant de système d'assainissement. Et j'ai réussi avec l'aide de communicants à traduire les enjeux de ce métier-là au sein d'une application qui finalement permettait à tous les usagers d'abord d'avoir une information précise, mais également de comprendre le métier qu'on faisait. Et donc, au fond, cette application qui a été téléchargée environ 7000 fois euh, au cours des étés 2015 et 2016, elle est le résultat d'un travail de communication vers le, les citoyens, mais surtout, elle est le résultat de plusieurs années de, de travaux et de réflexions sur la manière de protéger la qualité des eaux de baignade. Excellent, thank you. And um, another question I had, one one idea came to mind is, um, are you familiar with the, um, the car driving app Waze? Waze, thank you. Are you familiar with it? Yeah. Oui. So, um, so my question is um, interactivity with people on the beach. Uh, are they able to report, let's say, um, situations or sightings or, uh, you know, like, like Waz does, you know, it shows, oh, there's a hazard coming up ahead. Um, is there ways of interacting or to that you are able then to extrapolate all that uh, information so that you can learn from the audience engagement? Oui, alors cette application, vous, vous vous en doutez, elle a évolué. Et une des dernières innovations de l'application, ça a été euh, d'intégrer un bouton qui permettait de signaler un certain nombre d'anomalies, mais directement au service de la collectivité qui était concernée. Donc là, on était plutôt sur du flux d'informations opérationnelles. Et donc, la suite de l'application, c'est effectivement d'y intégrer une partie interactive, notamment sur la biodiversité. C'est-à-dire que, à partir des résultats de biodiversité et à partir d'une visite sous-marine, donc là je trahis un petit peu le, le secret de la suite de l'application, mais à la suite d'une visite sous-marine qui pourrait être visualisée directement sur l'application par l'utilisateur qui est sur la plage, je souhaiterais qu'on puisse signaler sur l'application justement si ce qu'on voit à l'écran est conforme et, et finalement complété également ce qui est, ce qui est euh, finalement une vision de biodiversité qui peut devenir participative. C'est-à-dire que c'est la notion de biodiversité participative, au fond, qu'on peut intégrer et qui se rapprocherait un peu de votre question sur Waze. Thank you. Um, questions Maybe another one from... Yes. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, for Ludwig first, uh, have you played fish banks? Um, yeah, I think fish bank uh, is the tabletop uh, digital uh, game which was made in Germany. No, made it at MIT. At it was, MIT, or maybe yeah, it, it was shown where well, the, I was. The point yeah. with, with fish banks is that uh, it's an interactive, well, it used to be a board, now it's interactive. You can play oceans, computers, groups, whatever. And uh, what it presents, it's, uh, if, you, if you leave, it's, it's fisheries management. And if you leave uh, open access, you fail. I have uh, failed even Greenpeace advocates and WWF advocates with that, with that game. It's kind of difficult without cooperation and information to success as a company in that uh, in that arena, uh, this this game was customized by the uh, Club of Rome people Meadows at all. Well, 
the, the, the game board that you presented, it's quite interesting, quite interesting, but it, it poses challenges, at least uh, questions that I've posed uh, to myself. Um, how do you, I mean, it's quite clear that you're, you're able to interact with stakeholders, with politicians, they love, they love to play, but it's quite, it seems to me, perhaps I'm wrong, quite oriented to infrastructure things, to, uh, I mean, how do you, how do you portray fussy things in the oceans? Let's say different levels of biodiversity, different levels of abundance of fish, things like that. I mean, for platforms, for infrastructure, this is straightforward, you can say, or for lines of, uh, of uh, uh, ship, ships, uh, uh, movement, it's quite straight through, but there are fussy things that at times the game, uh, perhaps, I'm not an expert on this, it's not uh, representing quite well. I'm very interested on the game and certainly, what were yeah, you doing yeah, in you the should, Gulf? You, you should come and, uh, should come and game, uh, play uh, a little bit. What were what you we, doing in the Gulf of Mexico? What we, what, what we, <laughs> well, we tried to do a level playing field, but what, what's really uh, at, at the heart of it is that there is a bit of a narrative. Three countries all have a little bit of a task, a political task, which we can play around with. Good. And um, not everything is known, so it's up to the players to develop based upon what the moderator sets up as the basic storyline. And if the, uh, the, the, so they need to develop, of course, their sea in, an, in, a, in a sustainable manner. So they, they have to actually start looking for, okay, where then we see in this area would be the coherence in the ecosystem. The funny thing is, and this is where the double, uh, this single double and triple loop learning kicks in, um, is that if you give a task to a player, they will start to perform it. So we tell them, do uh, something which is coherent over the sea basin. Everybody fails, like in fish bank, like in harvest. And then we moderate about that. Um, I asked the question to the uh, people with seas at risk. Can you tell me something about the coherence of the environment? They didn't want planning for environment. They lobby for environment, and if they play the game, they do oil, gas, shipping, shipbuilding, all these type of things. So then afterwards, we have a little talk, and we have a little laugh, so how come, how come that human mind is so much uh, predominated by always falling in the wrong trap? So we use the, the, the theories also of uh, Kahneman and the System 1, System 2 theories to back up the learning experience. And then the game is just the mode to get into a better way of learning. I'll finish the question. These games are very informative. Even decision makers can fail. So you show them the caveats of being there with that knowledge. But for, for theory, theory um, your application is it's a service. It's a quite uh, top-down applications. And a stakeholder certainly can respond to your applications uh, when, they su when they see macro things at the beach. How do you cope with fe feces? How do you cope with the microbes? How do you cope with the... Uh, with the uh, metals, heavy metals. How do you cope with uh, subtle micropollution that uh, we're not able to see? Alors effectivement, il, il existe d'abord un flux d'informations en fonction du traitement qui peut être fait, finalement, d'un signalement. C'est-à-dire que nous avons conçu les signalements pour préciser, finalement, quel était le type d'anomalies détectées, par exemple des déchets, par exemple, comme vous l'indiquiez, des, ex des excréments, par exemple, comme vous l'indiquiez encore, un certain nombre de, euh, de déchets qui peuvent être source microbienne pour euh, l'environnement. Et là, automatiquement, l'application, finalement, s'est renvoyée vers les... Euh, vers les services concernés, et l'action est mesurée, elle est quantifiée, elle est prévue. La petite difficulté qu'on peut avoir, c'est finalement de se caler complètement avec la réglementation. Aujourd'hui, quand on parle de qualité des eaux de baignade, on parle d'une directive qui est la directive de 2006, la directive européenne de 2006, et qui précise qu'on a deux marqueurs que sont les Echerichia coli et les entérocoques. 
tout est construit aujourd'hui autour de ces deux marqueurs. Pour autant, et je comprends la question comme ça aussi, il existe d'autres euh, éléments qui peuvent atteindre l'environnement et qu'il convient de mesurer. Là, je peux parler des microplastiques, mais je pourrais parler des perturbateurs endocriniens en général. Donc, effectivement, un des axes de progrès de l'application, c'est sans doute celui que vous évoquez dans la question. Oui. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Oh. My name is Ibukun Jacob Adeomi. I'm a student of the Erasmus Mundus Masters in Maritime Spatial Planning. Uh, my question goes down. Uh, it is very important to communicate MSP to policy and decision makers. And uh, I would like to ask that how much details is considered uh, appropriate in communicating MSP to decision makers, and also uh, which channel should we choose to communicate to uh, MSP? Is it uh, through audiovisual or mass media or face-to-face -face communication or a combination of both, of all of the above? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Marianne, do you feel like uh, taking this one? Yes. Um, well, the first reaction would be, it uh, depends on how interested the person is to how much detail you give. Um, well, my experience with policymakers is that they prefer half an A4 and then uh, know where to find the rest of the information. Um, so I, th I would say here also accounts uh, keep it simple but not, you know, reductionistic that you do not represent reality, especially with legislation. Uh, for instance, in the case of multi-use platforms, it's very complicated because. If you want to apply, if you want to do something at sea, how, many, how much regulation you need to go through, uh, people already you know, stop because it's so complicated. Um, I think there should be a combination of uh, different things on social media. For instance, um, the, 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 the one institute that made the movie, the video, is the Flanders Marine Institute in Belgium. They have an archive of ma marine um, information and uh, they try to put everything in an archive in detail and at the same time make stories on the wiki, uh, Wikipedia and spread the information for the bigger audience. And um, also the type of audiences changes over time. So, I mean, I used to learn when I did my PhD that my mother should understand what I was saying, you know. Um, so, you know, who do you address when you, when you give a message? So it, get, it gets more diversified in the type of messages you spread to the uh, different people. Thank you. Um, and one thing I'd like to add to that as well is, um, uh, as you pointed out, is knowing your audience. I mean, really knowing the needs of your audience. Uh, I mean, as in, in, in our field, is, uh, we usually start uh, by asking the question is, uh, what do you want your audience to, to think about what is it that you're doing? What do you want your audience to feel? And above all, what do you want your audience to do as an action step? So starting from there, you can then work backwards. But of course, as we've already been highlighting so far, is uh, tapping into that collective uh, intelligence. So yes, indeed, co-create it, co-design it, sit together with your stakeholders, sit together with your audiences, and really see it from their perspective and uh, get their insights. So in the meantime, before we take on the next question, let me highlight uh, the active poll that's coming up. Can we have that up on the screen, Vinicius? We have um, an upcoming poll uh, that's, um, what's the most interesting communication tool on Slido? Can we see that? Ah, here we go. So we're getting some of your uh, feedback live right now. Um, so what's the most interesting communication tool so far? Gaming is uh, an interactive, oh, interactive apps is uh, going up to number one. Gaming is a good second. Co-design, oh. It's moving all around the place. But this is great. That means uh, people are responding. So we'll come back to that later on. So we have uh, a few more minutes to capture some of your questions. So I have one here in the front, one there, one there. So yes, please. 
Je vais essayer de faire un retour euh, d'une activité de la COI euh, au Togo en 2003-2004 pour appuyer les quatre interventions qui sont de très bonnes interventions entre communication pour le populaire et les communications presque scientifiques pour le populaire. Alors, en 2003-2004, le projet Odin Africa de la Commission océanographique intergouvernementale nous a permis de développer un concept que nous avons appelé « découverte de l'océan ». Et ce sujet a concerné les élèves de classe terminale série C et série D pour pouvoir les mettre au cœur des activités d'océan, puisque généralement cette activité océan n'est pas très fort dans nos cursus scolaires. Donc nous avons réussi ceci avec tous les partenaires qui sont sur la mer et qui sont sur les côtes, et ça a été une grande réussite de communication. Alors ce que nous pensons à la suite de cette communication et à la suite de ce que nous avions depuis, c'est d'ouvrir la communication aujourd'hui grand public. En quoi faisant en, en proposant une initiative la journée mondiale des communications sur les océans, les mers et les côtes. Ceci peut intégrer l'ODD 14 et ceci peut s'appuyer sur la journée africaine des océans et des mers le 25 juillet. Donc si euh, le secrétaire exécutif euh, contient ce qui est important ici, de manière à ce que le monde entier un jour, célèbre avec tout le monde, les étudiants, les élèves, les mers, les océans et les côtes. Alors, j'ai proposé deux activités auxquelles on peut ajouter des activités dépendantes des environnements des différents milieux. Première fenêtre sur l'océan. Première fenêtre sur l'océan. Ça va consister à quoi À mener tout le monde sur la plage, leur proposer les activités que vous venez de faire et leur montrer la vivacité et la relation. Deuxième activité, la mer sur le boulevard. Ça consiste en quoi Ce grand écran, on l'installe sur les différentes parties des boulevards de nos villes. Et on arrête les lumières, je ne sais pas si on m'entend, et on arrête les lumières, il y a une coupure, I'll pass my microphone. Alors, je, je proposais deux activités. Première fenêtre sur l'océan et deuxième activité, la mer sur le boulevard. Ce grand écran que nous avons, on l'installe le long de tous les boulevards et on fait passer des stations sur la biodiversité marine, une autre station sur les accidents, une autre station sur tel effet, tel effet, au cours de cette journée de 25 juillet, ceci va appuyer ce que nous avons déjà en Afrique, la journée africaine des océans qui peut partir au niveau du monde entier, la journée internationale de communication des océans, des mers et des côtes. Merci. Thank you for your contribution. Um, we'll take a couple more questions and then we'll have a, a cocktail, yes. Uh, <laughs> we'll take one in the back and then next one. Yes, please. Oh, thank you, Christopher. It's Paul Gilliland again. I see my question's actually up there, but I wanted to explain why I asked it. And it's an experience I had yesterday. Somebody came over from the MSP challenge game where I was sat with a video demonstrating an information system we had and they said, oh, is this your MSP challenge game? I said, no. I said, oh, but I heard over in, in the other room that you do have an MSP challenge game and I said, uh, uh, not to my knowledge. <laughs> Uh, eventually, I worked out that what they were talking about is that we, we have a, a model of a piece of seabed. It's about an eight foot by four foot model, and it has a coastline, and you can put turbines on it, and there are cutouts of fish stocks, and all sorts of things. And it has some of the utility of the game that Ludwig talked about, and some of the value. It, it raises awareness, it acts as a, a focal point for starting conversations. And, and I think we made it in, in 2011. I don't know if that's before your first game, Ludovic, but it just struck me 
oh, we, maybe we should have mentioned this and shared this sort of what we've done with other people. So it, it prompted in my mind, you know, this morning we heard from, from consultants, they've done an inventory of various things uh, in, in, in planning projects around the world. Is the time right to do maybe a quick and easy inventory of all the different ideas and tools and other things that people have developed in their planning processes? Maybe a quick and easy questionnaire to the delegates of this conference would be a good start. Hence my question up there. Thank you. Yes, we should uh, put some uh, points together. Uh, we'll come back to that. Tara, you can share something. We'll get one more question and we can come to that. Uh, we had one question there at the far back. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for an excellent session. Marianne, I think this question is probably for you on the mermaid process. In that initial meeting with 80 people, what types of discussion was there on minimizing impact to marine species and systems during the design phase of that technology? And if there wasn't, would you envision a way to have a very early stage process for developing marine technology with the engineers and the scientists and lots of other stakeholders there to really co-create to have minimal or ideally no harm with getting the job done of the technology. Thank you. Thank you for your question. So let's work backwards from that so we can take Marianne's answer. We got um, scientists involved that did an uh, environmental analysis. Um, there were IMTA experts, ecosystems experts. And moreover, um, I also saw the uh, question, what if stakeholders do not want to get involved passing by, which is interesting. We had also in the round table discussions, people of the, uh, uh, that, that addressed the same question. Um, we were a theoretical exercise, so um, if you move up in the TRL levels uh, of new technologies, this, the urgency to look at the effects on the ecosystem get more uh, prominent. Um, so I think this question is very highly re relevant at this stage with the, with the European projects going on now, actually moving up from TRL 4 to TRL 6, 7, 8 and doing demonstration projects. So I can tell you who to ask this question, who is doing these projects. Um, and uh, another thing is, which I want to add to this, is that if you involve stakeholders in your design, you, get also, you also uh, create your own opposition. So that means that a lot of industries tend to say, okay, you know, we disclose this and uh, do not want the public uh, involved. But obviously you will get in the end, in, in a couple of uh, years or 10 years, you get the problems anyway. So, so you have to get th through this discussion on environmental and social consequences when you involve them, but you can also get resistance because there is sometimes obviously a, a damage to, uh, to the environment. Thank you. Um, we'll take the, the previous question, which was on uh, the collection of communication techniques. Maybe, um, Ludwig, you can share some of your thoughts on the question that Paul raised. Yeah. Um, I like, I like all, but be, be the way, in Togo, by the way, to, to communicate with, with the larger public by having stakeholders doing uh, the message on what is marine uh, life worth and what's the ocean worth. What are they doing out there and why would they think that maritime spatial planning or marine spatial planning would be a handy tool? I would never start promoting MSP in general to the public. I would like uh, promote values, uh -huh. food on the table, marine protein, uh, energy from the sea, uh, those type of things. Those are what the people are interested in. Um, they're not interested in the way we uh, have a process designed. It's more for the, for, the, for the process people themselves. And, and then when it comes to various communication things, yes, that's, uh, that's true, but it's also my experience that you cannot have so many communication interventions within your process working every time. What I did for writing our 2050 vision, which was a stakeholder-driven process, I made a conference newspaper actually a, a newspaper which we had at the conference and I asked the stakeholders to put in an adver advertisement which they did have, didn't have to pay for. Uh, but in fact it was a draft plan. It was a draft policy. 
They didn't know it. And I was after the conference looking, where did I find this paper? Was it thrown away or not? No, people took it. So, and, and they apparently liked what I was writing. But these type of interventions, communicating with your stakeholders, you can only do it once. I can share with everybody or those type of ideas, but making a scientific publication on what type of methods are there, ooh, then you get into this, all these details and stuff. So yeah, let's have a workshop. Let's everybody being, uh, we can have a, an online, whatever, modern tools, I love these interactive apps, uh, share ideas with one another. We live in the economy of ideas. Um, I don't know if it's helpful to, to make a list of all these type of communication interventions. You want to say something, Jochen, on that? Yeah, Jochen, you had something you wanted to add. Yeah, yeah thank you. But uh, first, first, I think it, it would be quite valuable to have, have a kind of a toolbox, what can be used easily, especially for all those who are were just starting. And maybe one thing I would like to, to table here as well is uh, we talk a lot about when we are in the process but uh, in, in many situations, it's also important to how to get the political commitment to do such a process, how to see the value of it, of this, this special planning. And uh, I would also, also say that, uh, on the other hand, we should have in mind that uh, uh, MSP is, the result is a society, societal process and result. And well, we should also make sure that if it goes in the in the right way, it, it is something that is politically important also to be elected or not elected sometimes. So uh, there is a need also for, for for the public or for the interested public to to understand that and to to create transparency as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. I think the, one of the key takeaways from. Uh, from that, uh, connecting to the first uh, comment we had earlier from our colleague right here in the front, is really uh, being able to access content, access information, pure and simple. How can we uh, really tap in to that collective intelligence, that collective wisdom that we all have, and to promote that transparency? So um, that brings us. Uh, close to the end. I'd like to thank uh, all the speakers. Uh, I would like to ask uh, each and every one of you to share some uh, closing uh, thoughts uh, on this session before we uh, jump to our cocktails. Alors effectivement, enfin moi ce que, je, ce que je retiens de ce qui a été dit, et je voyais le mot gaming et le mot fun apparaître à l'écran au moment où vous posiez la question, c'est que la communication, même si elle est complètement légitime venant des gens qui, dont c'est le métier, et, et finalement doit s'appuyer à la fois sur la prise en compte de euh, réalité des métiers que l'application va traduire, mais également sur finalement la participation aussi de l'ensemble des citoyens. Et ce que je veux dire par là, c'est qu'au fond, quand je, quand je nous entendais, quand j'entendais l'ensemble des questions, je venais me dire que euh, la suite de l'application et l'évolution de l'application devrait sans doute venir des citoyens eux-mêmes. Et je pense que la conception de la suite de l'application, et je réfléchirai à ça à l'issue de cette session, viendra sans doute des citoyens eux-mêmes. Voilà, je vous remercie. Yeah, in, the, in the terms of the power of storytelling, uh, let me t uh, share you one. Uh, when I was writing my hour, I was allowed to write our vision in the Netherlands. And uh, I wanted to check back with my amateur wreck divers. And I went up the way to the north. And I arrived at 10 o'clock in the morning. And I, they asked me, do you want coffee? We were on their boat. And they said, no, uh, you don't get coffee. Here you have a can of beer. And then I thought, okay, if I drink the beer, then maybe we can talk. But then there was another can of beer. And then I got the trust, and then we got the talk, and then I could look into their things. Um, sometimes you have to go all the lengths to get the communication going, and it's up to the MSP -er to put its effort in. Um, thank you. Yes, um, well, I am looking at these uh, remarks here, sunglasses uh, prominently in the middle. And I'm seeing from the different uh, reactions that also this 
public is a, a very uh, a variety of opinions on uh, on the usefulness of uh, this type of sessions because the one of the first that came in was blah blah so the person who did that please come to me uh, during the cocktail which is there also um, and tomorrow morning at uh, nine uh, we talk about blue growth which is uh, very, very, very important issue, and it's very interesting also to see how we can connect this with the, all the MSP processes going on uh, internationally. Thank you. So maybe first coming back on, on the issue of, of communication, I think what is important that you also plan the communication itself, that, that you have enough capacity and, and the tools uh, right with you to, to start it, so that, that this is a sort of systematic process as well. And maybe coming on, on the Blue Growth session tomorrow, I hope we will also find the, the sustainability boundaries of Blue Growth in that, in that session tomorrow. Excellent. Thank you all very much for sharing your thoughts on that. I'd like to turn to the audience right now and uh, ask uh, all of you who was uh, able or willing or daring to fill up that visual note. Can we see it? Can you hold it up? Who managed to spend a bit of time and dare to doodle? Oh, look at that. Hold it a little bit higher. Higher, 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 higher. Look at that. Some people were listening. Great. Um, let me also check in here with Maria. Maria, how are you doing? Hi. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing well. Great. So, you guys want to come and have a look? Just a quick uh, overview for the speakers. So, so Johan here spoke a little bit about uh, making people smile. I think I quite found that really interesting and uh, you need to f promote that fun element, of course, right? Uh, Co-creation together with your stakeholders. That's one of my favorite. Develop a common language. I think keeping it simple, stupid is a key. Um, what else? Celebrate the day of the ocean and seas. I think this is, this is a perfect uh, time to celebrate. Don't you guys think? That was so loud. Okay, so can we put your hands together, please, for the four speakers? And we thank you all for sharing and taking the time.